Really excited to be here and see everyone. Um, so I will talk about uh, explainable neural networks for images and text. And thanks a lot, Alberto, for the motivation for uh, explainability. Uh, I hope he convinced you. Uh, so now uh, the question is, how do we actually do that for uh, text and for images which are, have higher dimensions and have their own special issues? Yeah, so first, what, what do I mean by explainability here? So mostly I'm interested in... Um, yeah, so mo mostly I'm uh, interested in uh, explaining uh, individual predictions. So why is the network making certain predictions? So it's like local uh, in, in the terminology used. Uh, because I think it's more developed and more actionable at the moment. And um, so, again, why is it useful? So my, just my take on it, it's incredibly useful for you as a machine learning uh, model developer because it allows you to debug your models, to uh, um, see issues with your data set, to uh, propose new features, and also it's really useful to the users or to non-technical members of your team to be able to understand your model. Um, so here's an example, uh, a different one, but also from the Lime tutorial. So here is, we have an image of a dog and the cat, and an explanation for the dog prediction might look like this. So we have uh, positive, highlighted positive and negative parts of the image. We see that the uh, dog's head has, is positive and the cat's head is negative. And uh, seeing this explanation, we trust the model more. We, we understand, okay, it understands that this is a dog and this is a cat, and we see why it's making this prediction. And another example, you have already seen this one. So uh, this is the husky classified as wolf incorrectly due to the snow. And again, seeing this explanation, we see that there is an issue with the data set that needs to be fixed. Um, so how can we do this? Uh, and this is an outline of my talk. We can um, either take the off-the-shelf model, which we already trained or someone already trained, and try to explain it using either black box methods or gradient-based methods, or uh, we can uh, build our model uh, and uh, keep in mind, keeping interpretability uh, in mind, so build intrinsically explainable model. And so first, um, I will talk about uh, uh, explaining black box models, uh, explaining models using black box approach. Black box means we don't look inside the model, we just take predictions uh, from the model and um, explain them uh, without looking into the details. Um, so um, there is um, the Lime, there is a Python package, and also I recommend checking out the paper because it's extremely readable and it also has not only the technical description of the algorithm, but really interesting experiments, including experiments with human judgment, um, uh, which, like, again, show uh, how uh, interpretability can be important. And so, um, Alberto already explained Lime, but let me take, just uh, do another take on this. So we take the, uh, so the red cross is the prediction which we're trying to explain. So this is a plot of the features, two features shown here, and we're trying to separate blue region from the pink region. And uh, we're trying to approximate a complex decision boundary uh, in one point by a simple uh, model which is easy to explain. So in this case, it's a linear model. And we sample uh, a lot of examples close to the example which we're trying to explain. And based on these examples, we try to build a, a simple linear model which is given uh, approximately the same explanation uh, as our complex model. And uh, this explanation is, uh, should be approximately correct near this example if we are able to approximate the complex model uh, well. And it's trivial to explain a linear model. You can just analyze its coefficients. Uh, but uh, what is the problem here? The problem with images is how do we create these samples? So, and this is a common team theme uh, for all approaches. So if you just uh, change individual pixel of an image, it does not change much because it, it, it would be the same image. If you, for example, change all pixels of the image by adding some small random vector, this is the same as adding some noise to the image. 
This will either make the image incomprehensible if the noise is large or won't change the class is if the noise is small. So we need to sample, um, to create these samples uh, in a better way. And so how, how it's done, uh, it's done with, so the Lime offers propose to use super pixels. So super pixels are like big regions of the image which um, like look similar inside one superpixels, whereas different superpixels look different. So it's an unsupervised uh, way of breaking image into different parts, like a mosaic. And instead of sampling individual, changing individual pixels, we can sample these superpixels. For example, we can black out some of the superpixels inside the image and see how prediction uh, changes. And yeah, this is how it looks like. So uh, we have already seen, for example, for again, for the cat example, we see that the cat is like the super pixels were aligned with the cat boundary and the model is uh, correctly explaining the cat prediction. And this was, okay. And uh, now um, there is a related baseline. Instead of using super pixels, we could be using uh, what's called occlusion. So we could uh, have a, a rectangle, uh, for example, five by five rectangle, and slide it uh, along the image, uh, again, blacking out certain parts of the image and check how, uh, the Im how prediction changes. This is much simpler to implement, but uh, the problem is that if we take this rectangle to be too small, for example, one by one, or five by five even. So this is a, an image of the snake, by the way. So the snake is like in the right part of the image, if you can see it. And uh, as you see, only 15 by 15 occlusion produces a reasonable explanation. And this method is really slow. So Lime is already slow because you need um, sometimes thousands of samples, but this method is much, much smaller. So, and it's really, um, it's really tricky to, uh, to choose the right occlusion size, so it's mostly used as a baseline because it is incredibly simple, and it's simple to understand how it works. Um, now for uh, text, what do we do for text? So text is also high dimensional, but in a different way. Well, with text, we at least can uh, change individual words. For example, we can remove some words, or we can um, replace words by other random words. Well, this is an example of a black box explanation from uh, LI5 package, which also implements Lime algorithm, especially for text. And um, so here, um, this works uh, quite well in simple cases, but what if, for example, your model is some uh, model which takes really takes context into account, uh, then you just black out one word, it may be a very strange sample, so you might need a lot of samples and blacking out uh, n-grams of words. And if the model is a character-based uh, neural network, for example, then it wouldn't make sense to black out words. You would need to sample and black out uh, characters. And this, again, increases the number of samples you need to make. So. Uh, while it works, it, the sampling procedure is the really complicated bit here, and you need to adjust the sampling procedure to the uh, input domain and sometimes even to the uh, model which you are using. Uh, yeah, so to conclude, a great advantage of Lime is that it works with any model, and by any model I mean that, for example, in the model you can have some pre-processing and post-processing step which you are typically not analyzing, but Lime allows you to analyze like your whole pipeline from end to end, so this can be uh, valuable. But uh, the number of samples needed is really uh, large. For example, thousands of samples for image models, so it's not, not interactive at all. And also this uh, sampling might produce, might sometimes not produce correct explanations. And while there are some tools to uh, check if your explanation is uh, good or not, but they are not like not really easy to use for non-technical uh, users. Yeah, but still, I think in many contexts, Lime is a good uh, algorithm or uh, a good algorithm to check against, at least. Uh, now to another approach to explaining off-the-shelf models, uh, neural networks is 
uh, gradient-based methods. So in gradient-based me methods, we assume that our model is uh, differentiable, and so we can take derivatives with uh, and um, in theory, they are fast because we're just taking derivatives. We, they are uh, accurate. We, are, we don't have this issue with uh, sampling. And um, also, we don't need as much adaptation for different input domains. Yeah, but in theory, this is all good. But in practice, it's not, um, not always that great. So let me first uh, explain a basic gradient-based method, how it works. So, uh, in the model, we have the input and the output. So if we take a partial derivative of the output with respect to the input, so we have a particular output, and we see, uh, so these derivatives means how much changing particular elements of the input influences the output. So this is a bit like uh, this partial dependence plot, but because we are taking derivatives, we can take this derivative really uh, efficiently. It's uh, the same cost as doing one prediction, but uh, we, are, we obtain this uh, derivative for all input features. So it's like a magic trick to uh, create a PDP plot for all features of your model, even if there are a million of features. So that sounds awesome. But th there are some problems with this. So one problem is that, again, our input is incredibly high dimensional. So knowing how just one single tiny feature influences the result might be not as useful. Uh, another problem is that uh, derivative can be zero. For example, we have a um, ReLU unit, which is not firing, and its derivative is zero. But it still can be useful information that something is not predicted can be also useful, and we lose this information. And there are also several variants to improve this, like we take only positive derivatives uh, into account, only positive derivatives, or only positive derivatives with positive activations. Um, so these are like techniques to improve the explanation, and there are also uh, various variants, which again uh, try to improve on this, but in my opinion, the end result is still not great. So these are images from the paper which takes a uh, unified approach to different gradient-based uh, explanation methods and um, like compares them both mathematically and empirically. And so here are explanations for the same snake picture. And so salience maps is the first approach, and then there are a couple of more advanced approaches. But still, we can see that um, well, we have a lot of unnecessary details which are likely irrelevant to the explanation and the explanation itself is kind of fuzzy and it's hard uh, to trust it. So it breaks down in a lot of cases. So maybe it's just me, so I would like to hear from you if you have experience uh, using gradient-based methods, but at the current stage, to, to me, they look more like a promising research direction than something which uh, can be robustly used uh, in practice, so unfortunately. Um, so this brings me to the method which I think works best. Uh, it is building intrinsically explainable models, well, models which can be explained due to the uh, little tricks we put into them. And this is one example. I think this is the most important bit of the lecture, so understand, because this idea can be applied in many contexts and extend it in many ways. So um, this is image classification. We have on the left, we have um, image input. And on the right, we have a C, uh, CAM, CAM class activation map, which is overlaid over the image. And so this is an explanation of prediction for Australian terrier, so a dog, which is a line uh, in the bottom of the frame. And this explanation looks perfectly good to me, so it, it is not some fuzzy and it doesn't have a lot of necessary details, but it tells that, okay, the network correctly localized where the dog is, and at least it understands uh, uh, where the dog is located and correctly classifies it. And so let's see how it works. Uh, we need a particular network structure for it to work, but as we'll see, it's quite common. So first we need some convolutional network, which can also have like various layers, but uh, at the end we have some last uh, convolutional layer 
For example, for ResNet, this might be a layer which for like typical inputs produces a 32 by 32 activation maps with like several hundred uh, filters in it. And let's check that part in more detail. Uh, so we have this last convolutional uh, layer. After that, we have a global average pooling, which means that we take uh, the average across this 32 by 32 special grid of each filter separately, and we get uh, a one single number for each uh, filter from the last convolutional layer. And then we have the last linear layer with a softmax, so we just multiply these uh, averages by some uh, value specific for a particular class and arrive at the final prediction. So this is just an explanation how like typical ResNet network works with a global average pooling and a linear layer at the end. Now, how can we use this to arrive at this explanation? So we can uh, reverse the order of computations a bit, but still get the same result. So this is what is shown in the bottom. Uh, so this, this frame, Sorry, this frame is uh, activations from one of the filter, from the first filter. And then we can first multiply this filter by its weight, W1, then uh, take the activations from the second filter, again multiplied by the weight, then add everything together, and then after that uh, perform averaging. So result will be the same in this case, but this decomposition gives us this nice picture on the right, so we can perform this operation and before averaging, we get an explanation for a prediction of a particular class. And it turns out that uh, it's not given that this explanation must make sense, but experiments show that indeed this uh, explanation makes a lot of sense. And uh, uh, how, how do we know this? Because, for example, we can try to perform uh, localization uh, using these uh, class activation maps. So, for example, we train a classifier, but this classifier is able to tell us where exactly the, ball, the uh, target object is located. And the uh, quality of this localization is really high, it's comparable to uh, models which were explicitly trained to uh, localize uh, the object. Now, the problem is, so let's say we want to use this approach, but we have a co more complicated model. So at the end, we don't have just one global average pooling and one layer. We have something more complicated. For example, we are doing uh, image captioning. So we're trying to predict the uh, text description of what is shown in the image. We cannot use this approach anymore. And now, uh, Greg, oh, yeah, by the way, one, one point that uh, a lot of off-the-shelf uh, models already work uh, in this way, and so uh, this method, uh, class activation maps, can be applied directly to them without any tricks. So if you're doing just image classification with a uh, network where the last, uh, at the end, you have a global average pooling and softmax, then you can use CAM straight away. And it's incredibly simple to implement. So there, there is a like example um, from the office of the paper uh, with cam implementation of PyTorch, and it's also implemented for all major packages. But like the the main part of the implementation is just one line, which just takes this like the sum that I told about. And this is it. Uh, okay, so now the question is, what if we have a more complex uh, model? then um, we have, might have a more complex head, we might have even a more complicated output, like for example a string of, of words instead of a class. And then we can use an extension of, of this method called uh, GradCam. Uh, so GradCam um, can, for example, this is an image captioning problem, and we have a caption, a bedroom with a bed and a desk. So this is a prediction of a network, or we can feed um, arbitrary uh, string into it and ask it to explain this string. And it correctly explains that, yeah, the uh, bed is there and the desk is... Oh, actually, it's not, it's not correct, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So it correctly identifies the bed, but, like, the desk is on lower, but it highlights the... Uh, the uh, picture, not the desk there. Uh, I just noticed only one, only, only now. 
Uh, so how it works, uh, so this is a big picture, we'll simplify it in a while, in a minute, uh, but so we have again this uh, convolutional neural network which works on the image input. We still need to have this, but well, if you're working with images, you're still going to use a convolutional neural network at the start. But, but then you have, after the last convolutional uh, layer, you can have any task-specific network. For example, you have image captioning, you have multiple fully connected layers, you can have anything. And at the end, you still can obtain these nice-looking class activation maps. And the way you do this is, so this is a like relevant part of that picture. Uh, so the way you do this, so we have this, again, these activations from the last uh, convolutional layer, but we cannot, um, like, they then uh, are, like, mm, processed in some complicated way in this task-specific network. So what we can do is we can, uh, again, take the derivative of, but here we can uh, take the derivative uh, just of the task which takes into account only the task-specific network. So by taking this derivative, we uh, see how changing uh, one of these high-level features in this uh, last activation layer influences the final prediction. So this is combining the uh, class activation map idea with the uh, simple gradient-based method. And it works uh, nicely, much nicer than um, vanilla gradient-based uh, methods. Um, so this is the same thing in, yeah, written uh, in the formula. I think we can skip this for now. Um, yeah, so I think th this was uh, one example which uh, the class activation methods and the gradient uh, class activation maps which can be applied to many to almost all image-based problems when you have some, you take the, some uh, convolutional uh, layer and then either use its activations directly or take the derivatives and again obtain the explanation in terms of this last layer. Um, another example, in many cases, uh, interpretability is uh, useful. Um, like, uh, we can take some features from the network and visualize them. For example, attention, which is used in many sequence-to-sequence -sequence models and improves results, can also be uh, visualized to understand at which part of the input is the network looking when uh, translating the sentence. So uh, this like attention mechanism is now a standard building block and it also uh, works really nicely with uh, visualization. Uh, now, have, yeah, so regarding text, in general, text happens to be much less uh, studied than images for some reason, um, probably because it's just harder to, to work with. So first is that the same idea as we've uh, we had with class activation maps can be applied to uh, convolutional networks for text. Because we, again, we have this uh, convolution, which is in this case one dimensional, and we can take the, so we cannot take the derivative with respect to input because it's discrete, there are words, but we can take, uh, again, the derivative with respect to the last convolutional layer in our, uh, in our network which is applied to text. Uh, also, if we have, for example, a bidirectional LSTM with a global leverage pooling, we still can apply the same class activation map idea. And we can also use a tension uh, mechanism if it is built in uh, into the network. But in general, there are not as many examples, so I linked ones here, and I'll upload slides to Slack. Uh, okay, now I have, um, how much time do I have? Maybe a few minutes left? Yes. Okay, perfect. So. Um, another thing, let's skip this one. Yeah, another thing is, so when you're choosing which model to use, you can also think about which approach would be more interpretable. So this is um, an aerial image shoot from a drone uh, of uh, different sea lions, and the task was to count how many uh, different sea lions are there in the image. And 
uh, naive appro well, one approach to the problem is to solve this task end-to-end, -end, like is fashionable. So you just take the input, uh, an image, and you output the number of uh, C lines of a particular kind. So treat it as a uh, regression problem. Uh, but another approach would be a two-phase approach. So first you predict where the C line uh, is located. For example, you can predict probability density that, okay, somewhere here there must be a C line, somewhere there there must be another C line, and then you can, well, either just uh, sum these, these probabilities or build a second level model on them. So this sounds more complicated to implement and to debug, but it turns out that, well, the second approach is much more interpretable. Why? Because we have this intermediate prediction of the uh, probabilities. So if we have some input, which is a messy image with a lot of C lines, then with this approach, we can have output which predicts where each C line lies and what kind of C line it is. And so by looking at this intermediate prediction, we can tell where is the network making a mistake. So for example, it is confusing uh, two classes of C lines which are close together, or it is confusing C lines with stones, which is totally reasonable. But still, this uh, intermediate output gives us insight into what the network is doing. So when choosing between these two approaches, we can uh, choose an interpretable one, and it would allow us to debug the issues much faster and to understand the issues much faster. And yeah, some useful links. So uh, for images, there are robust libraries which you can use, which implement both uh, gradient-based uh, methods, and especially they implement the gradchem method, which is, I think, very robust and can be just used with a lot of models uh, on images and on uh, convolution networks for text. Uh, then there is this really instructive example of how to implement the class activation maps, vanilla class activation maps for PyTorch. It's very short and easy. Uh, okay, there are also links to Lime and LI5 libraries, and I recommend checking uh, two papers, the Lime paper and the uh, Gradcam paper. So the Lime paper is interesting mostly from, uh, from the experiments that they did to prove that uh, interpretability works and is useful. And the Grad paper, I think it's useful because uh, this idea can be uh, applied uh, in a lot of context, but you need to understand how it works to uh, apply it in, in some unusual context. And I think that's all. Yeah, thank you a lot. And so, do you have any questions? Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question. Uh, as you know, we, in, we can trick easy today a model by using a white nose or uh, move in another direction a pixel. So what we call today um, adversarial attack, can we think to detect any adversarial attack by using a more interpretable model? And can we detect and hope to stop this kind of attack with that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think that, so first, so the, the question is, uh, yeah, regarding adversarial attacks. Uh, first, uh, gradient-based explanation methods can also be fooled by the uh, adversarial attacks, uh, especially if you're doing like adversarial attack against the explanation method. Uh, I think that the, uh, the CAM approach is much more robust to adversarial attacks, and it will show you the. Uh, it well, it might show you the issue of the model. But again, for example, um, if if you really want, you can fool it as well. Because for example, you have this uh, image of the dog in the bottom. Okay, and you can perform adversarial adversarial attack against specifically this region. So against this dog, and now, um, 
the class activation map will look the same, but the explanation will be different. But, and also, for example, if you want to, well, if you you still with an adversarial attack, you can basically do anything you want if you really control everything. Uh, and but again, the human can easily detect an adversarial attack by just examining if the human is able to do the classification uh, themselves. So, well, it, yeah, it means that explanation methods in general are not not do not save you from adversarial attacks that much. I, I think so. Hi, yeah. One question, maybe weird. So, how easy are all these interpretability methods to be included in a fully automated uh, process? So, with no human intervention, like this, any of these interpretability techniques, uh, can they be like with some kind of back propagation to the model, give information to the model, and make the the model be improved? Or they are pretty much for a human. To, to make a decision? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so in, in a number of papers which were uh, trying to make the network more interpretable, uh, while trying to make the network more interpretable, they also improved the model. So for example, uh, if you introduce attention, you uh, introducing attention both makes the model more interpretable and uh, improves the model. Uh, now, I, I, an, another approach, another possible approach would be, uh, for example, to use somehow class activation maps to uh, make the network concentrate on the right uh, regions of the image. I don't remember any papers that tried to do this, but I think this could be yeah, this could be possible. For example, you could do some pseudo labeling, or maybe. But I don't remember any papers uh, that did it. But I think, like in general, making the model more interpretable often just makes the model better as well. For example, also like average pooling. Uh, I think the pri one of the primary motivations was also interpretability, and it happened to work so nicely with um, for classification as well. More questions, maybe? Thanks. Uh, do you have a few examples where uh, modern interpretability helped you in debugging your mm, convolution networks in Kaggle or in real life? Uh, yeah, so w one example is this uh, sea lions. Um, yeah, it, uh, it was from a Kaggle competition, and here uh, seeing how what the model predicts was uh, helpful to improve it. Uh, another example, which I didn't cover here, so uh, at work we do uh, extraction of, uh, of structured data from web pages, and as input we use uh, both a screenshot of the whole page and also HTML structure and the text. And uh, so there we used this, um, like a more simple approach, which just allowed us to see which of these uh, free inputs uh, influenced a particular prediction more. So for example, we detect this, this is a headline, while this was should be not a headline and something else. And we can see why does it happen? Is it, does it happen because of the text or does it happen because of some HTML structure, particular HTML structure of this headline? And then it pointed like into direction, in which direction to look and how to change either the structure of the network or the way we uh, feed uh, the features uh, into uh, into them. Uh, maybe one more. Yeah, sure. Uh, regarding the Sea Alliance uh, competition, uh, you showed us um, a multitask uh, network to do the segmentation and the countings, isn't true? Uh, not exactly. So here the network uh, is uh, doing only segmentation. So it predicts the probability density separately for each class of sea lion, 
of uh, the sea lion being actually there. Now to predict the count, uh, I had a second level model. Uh, so I created a number of features from these uh, probability maps. So the number one feature is just sum of uh, the probabilities over the whole map. Then also there were like sums above some thresholds. Then there were some blob detections. But, well, about 10 features. And they were fed into an XGBoost model, which then predicted the actual count. So yeah, you can't win Kaggle without XGBoost. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, then I have a question. Uh, thank you. 